Good evening, I'm Amna Nawaz. Jeff Bennett is away. On the news hour tonight, our exclusive interview with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan as wars rage on in Gaza and Ukraine. The U.S. Surgeon General calls for warning labels on social media amid a teen mental health crisis in America. And a look at the different impacts costly new weight loss drugs are having on the economy. It's about 20% decline in monthly spend on groceries for a one-person household. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. And friends of the news hour, including Leonard and Norma Chlorfein and the Judy and Peter Bloom Kovler Foundation. Two retiring executives turn their focus to greyhounds, giving these former race dogs a real chance to win. A Raymond James financial advisor gets to know you, your purpose, and the way you give back. Life well planned. The William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. For more than 50 years, advancing ideas and supporting institutions to promote a better world at Hewlett.org. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the News Hour. Israeli officials say Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has dissolved his war cabinet. The body was formed in a show of unity after the October 7 Hamas attacks to make key decisions about the fighting in Gaza. But last week, centrist member Benny Gantz resigned in protest of Netanyahu's handling of the war. Officials say the prime minister will now rely more on his security cabinet, which includes some far-right members who oppose a ceasefire deal. At the U.S. State Department today, spokesman Matthew Miller said the shift will not affect U.S. relations with Israel. We have made clear when they take actions that we disagree with. Uh, we've made that clear publicly, and I can tell you we've had some very direct conversations privately as well with the senior, gov um, senior members of the government of Israel about those policies that we think are uh, unproductive, not only to the plight of the Palestinian people, but to Israel's security. On the ground in Gaza, Israel engaged in its first daily tactical pause along a seven-mile road starting at the Kerem Shalom border crossing in southern Gaza. The Israel Defense Forces announced the pause on Sunday. It's meant to get more humanitarian aid into Gaza, where experts warn that a famine looms. Video today showed truckloads of supplies driving through the crossing, but Israel says the UN, which is responsible for distributing aid inside Gaza, has, quote, yet to take full advantage of the protected road. More than 20 countries in the NATO alliance will hit their defense spending targets this year, a new record. That's according to NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, who's visiting Washington this week. It comes as Russia's war in Ukraine looms large over much of Europe. Only six nations met this same goal just three years ago before Russia invaded. Meeting today with President Joe Biden, Stoltenberg spoke of the high stakes next month when NATO leaders will gather in Washington. I think it's important to understand that the stronger our support for Ukraine is, the sooner this war can end, because the sooner President Putin will realize that he cannot await those out. Some NATO members are concerned about a potential Trump re-election in November. The former president has characterized NATO countries as freeloading on U.S. military spending. He's vowed not to defend any members that fall short of defense spending targets. Maryland Governor Wes Moore issued more than 175,000 pardons for marijuana convictions today. His office says it's the biggest such action ever taken at the state level. With the stroke of a pen and a smile, Moore signed the executive order to forgive low-level charges for cannabis and paraphernalia possession. 
Maryland legalized recreational marijuana last year, and Moore says it's a chance to right historical wrongs. When it comes to cannabis, rolling out one of the best and most equitable legal markets in the country is incredibly important. But that rollout must go hand in hand with pardoning past conduct, and Maryland is going to lead by example. Black Americans are more than three times as likely to be arrested for marijuana possession as white Americans, according to the ACLU. It's going to be dangerously hot for much of the Midwest, Mid-Atlantic, and Northeast this week. Already, more than 70 million people were under extreme heat alerts today. And the National Weather Service estimates that more than 260 million Americans will experience temperatures above 90 degrees this week. Some of those could be record highs, including in New York City. We want to be clear, uh, this is extremely hot for June. And New Yorkers should not underestimate the heat. Uh, with climate change leading to more frequent and intense heat, uh, summers are different than they were before. The heat has fueled severe Midwest storms, leading to scenes like this in western Michigan, where a trampoline was tossed in the air. And it's created tinderbox conditions out west. In California, firefighters are working to contain the Post Fire, which has burned 24 square miles north of Los Angeles. Firefighters are battling another blaze in Northern California's Sonoma wine country. It was 20% surrounded today after burning nearly two square miles. A federal judge has temporarily halted a Biden administration rule expanding Title IX protections for LGBTQ plus students in six additional states. The preliminary injunction applies to Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. Last week, a different judge blocked the rule in Louisiana, Mississippi, Montana, and Idaho. At least 20 Republican-led states have been fighting the measure, which is due to take effect in August. It would expand civil rights protections, expand the definition of sexual harassment at schools and colleges, and add safeguards for victims. And on Wall Street today, stocks started the week on solid footing thanks to further gains in the tech sector. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 188 points to close over 38,000. The Nasdaq hit its sixth straight record, adding 168 points. The S&P 500 ended at a new high. On the news hour, a new form of male contraception shows promise in clinical studies. Amy Walter and Sophia Kai break down the latest political headlines. And a new book examines the battle over race and identity in America's classrooms. This is the PBS NewsHour from WETA Studios in Washington and in the West from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. A top aide to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky today called this weekend's Ukraine Peace Conference a success. It was derided just as definitively by the Kremlin as ineffective. Russia was not invited. More than 90 nations attended the summit in the Swiss Alps. Nick Schifrin sat down yesterday with U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, who accompanied Vice President Kamala Harris. Last night, PBS News Weekend aired part one of that conversation. Tonight, part two begins on the front lines in eastern Ukraine. Jake Sullivan, thank you very much. Welcome to the news there. Thanks for having me. Does the agreement that you've made with Ukraine to allow Ukraine to fire American weapons just over the border into Russia at Russian forces that are about to attack into Ukraine, does that extend beyond the Kharkiv region, including into the Suma region where Russian forces have also been targeting Ukraine? It extends to anywhere that Russian forces are coming across the border from the Russian side to the Ukrainian side to try to take additional Ukrainian territory. So that could include That's the happened in Kharkiv. We've seen initial indications that uh, Russia has made um, ex exploratory moves across in Sumy, and so it, it would apply there as well. This is not about geography, it's about common sense. If Russia is attacking or about to attack from its territory into Ukraine, it only makes sense to allow Ukraine to hit back against the forces that are hitting it from across the border. Of course, Russia is attacking Ukraine from all parts uh, of Russia. Why draw the line there? This week's bilateral security agreement obliges the U.S. to, quote, support Ukraine's efforts to win today's war. How do you expect Ukraine to win if it can't attack Russian forces that use Russia itself as a sanctuary? Well, first, we are permitting uh, Ukrainian forces to attack Russian forces using Russia as a sanctuary in the areas where on the battlefield 
they are attacking from inside Russia with artillery, with other ground-based munitions. Second, we've made clear, and we have seen over the course of the past two years Ukraine do this, that they can use air defense systems, including those supplied by the United States, to take Russian planes out of the sky, even if those Russian planes are in Russian airspace, right, if they're about right. to fire into Ukrainian airspace. Ukraine has suggested publicly that the F-16s they'll begin to operate in the near future will be based outside of Ukraine. Is that the plan to put the F-16s in a NATO country? The plan is to put the F-16s in Ukraine. And the bilateral security agreement that the president, President Zelensky signed, reinforced this point that we want to help Ukraine have this capability. It should be a capability based in Ukraine. The bilateral security agreement uh, obliges the U.S. for 10 years to share weapons, intelligence sharing, long-term training, joint weapons production. You struggled to get the supplemental through Congress. Joe Biden might not be the president next year, and former President Trump has questioned whether the U.S. should continue to support military aid and other aid to Ukraine. Why make a commitment that you don't know whether the U.S. can keep? Well, first, I do believe the U.S. will keep it. There is a strong bipartisan majority for supporting Ukraine in both the House and the Senate and among the American public. And that majority was actually reflected in the vote on the supplemental. More than 300 votes in the House, more than 70 votes in the Senate. And I believe that that is an enduring commitment that we see from both parties, and it will ultimately shine through. It's dangerous to ever assume what former President Trump would do if he were reelected, but there's no guarantee that he will respect the bilateral security agreement, right? In life in general, and in democracy in particular, there are never any absolute lock stock guarantees. Things can change, leaders can change, uh, situations can change. All President Biden can do is set a course and a vision for what is in the United States' national security interest, what is in the interest of the transatlantic alliance, and what is in the interest of our partnership with Ukraine. And that type of approach has historically served America well, and President Biden is going to stick with that approach for as long as he is president of the United States, which he, of course, expects to be for another four years. Let me switch to Israel. Uh, indirect negotiations between Israel and Hamas have resumed uh, this uh, past week after Hamas formally replied to the roadmap that President Biden laid out. A regional official tells me that Hamas is asking for a timeline of a permanent uh, ceasefire and an Israeli withdrawal from Gaza. The roadmap that's been laid out only obliges Israel to have a temporary uh, ceasefire that would continue so long as negotiations uh, were continuing. Uh, is that Hamas proposed change dead on arrival? I don't think that the current proposal just obliges a temporary pause. It is a roadmap, as the president said in his remarks at the end of May, to an end to the war. Now it's true, the first phase is set out six weeks. And in those six weeks, the goal is to negotiate the necessary conditions to put in place a permanent cessation of hostilities. And that formula, permanent cessation of hostilities, is in the proposal that was sent to Hamas. Now, if within the six weeks, all of those conditions aren't agreed indirectly between Israel and Hamas, then they stay at the negotiating table and the ceasefire remains in place. And that is what's different about this proposal, that Israel is committed to continuing that temporary ceasefire so long as negotiations continue. That's right. Now, Hamas has come back with changes to the agreement. I wouldn't characterize it exactly as you've just put it, but it is certainly the case that they are looking for a move from phase one to phase two uh, that gives them a sense that there will actually be a permanent end to hostilities. And is that now, dead on arrival or is that a possibility? From my perspective, this is a negotiation. Israel authorized a proposal to be put forward. Hamas has come back with some elements that in our view are understandable, not unanticipated, and other elements that are out of step with what the UN Security Council set forward and what was in President Biden's speech. Now, you, there needs to be a back and forth, and we need to bridge the remaining gaps and get to a conclusion. Do you believe Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar considers the many Gazans who have died, quote, necessary sacrifices? that would create worldwide pressure on Israel, as the Wall Street Journal reported recently, he told mediators. So I have not heard that specific phrase uh, other than reading it in the Wall Street Journal. But I will Has tell you express something similar, even if that I, I am language. concerned, I am concerned that Sinwar and other Hamas leaders are making a crude and cynical calculus with the lives of innocent Palestinian people. And I think the best way to prove that in fact they do care about the lives and the well-being of Palestinian civilians is to agree to a ceasefire. There's a lot of concern that on the Israeli side, Benjamin Netanyahu is either unwilling or unable to get this deal through uh, the current coalition. Are you worried both sides are more interested in blaming the other for failure rather than actually making progress? 
Look, in any negotiation, there's a risk of, of that kind of dynamic taking hold. But I will tell you, the Israeli government has remained steadfast in standing behind the proposal that was put forward in May. It has not walked the away from government, that. You mean the prime minister? The prime himself, minister right. has not walked away from it, has not picked up the phone and said to President Biden, hey, by the way, I'm backing off this thing. He has stood by it. He stood by it not so much publicly, but you've said repeatedly, and the Secretary of State says repeatedly, he's privately, he has reassured you guys that yes, he's behind this proposal. That right? is correct. And if Hamas took that proposal tomorrow, I believe that proposal would go into effect. Are you concerned at all that Netanyahu is extending the war in order to stay in power or to wait till the November U.S. election? Look, I've learned long ago not to characterize the motives of leaders to only judge them by their actions. And the action I see is an Israeli prime minister who authorized a proposal to be put forward that President Biden laid out for the world, that the UN Security Council endorsed, and if Hamas would take it, Israel would take it. Israel's making progress in Rafah. Do you believe that pushed pressure on Israel not only to agree to a ceasefire, but also to talk more concretely about the day after plan? There will come a moment when the shift from major military operations to some other reality is going to have to take place. And that may be sooner rather than later. Finally, bring us back to Ukraine and the summit. The peace that the world and, and the U.S. Uh, and you've been speaking about for the last 24 hours here uh, is in part about respecting the principles of international law. The State Department recently concluded it's reasonable to assess U.S. weapons have been used by Israel since October the 7th inconsistent with its international humanitarian law obligations. Is there a U.S. double standard? President Biden has enunciated the same principle when it comes to Israel that he has enunciated with respect to Ukraine. Israel has a right to defend itself against a vicious and brutal terrorist organization, but it has a responsibility even despite the burden of having to fight Hamas in hospitals and schools to do the utmost to protect civilians. And our position with respect to Russia and Ukraine is that Russia has no right whatsoever to invade a sovereign country, uh, cause harm, and operate in utter and complete flagrant violation of the UN Charter. What the president is most concerned about is the human dimension of each of these conflicts. And that sense of motivation to try to bring peace and security on the basis of a fair and just outcome in both Gaza and in Ukraine, that's something that motivates him every day. Jake Sullivan, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Surveys show the overwhelming majority of American teens use social media in some form, with roughly 90% on YouTube, over 60% on TikTok and Snapchat, and nearly 60% on Instagram. Some studies now link more than three hours a day on social media to increased risk of teen anxiety and depression, leading the U.S. Surgeon General in a new op-ed today to call for a warning label on social media platforms. And joining us now is the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy. Dr. Murthy, welcome back to the News Hour. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Amna, for having me. So I need to point out, this would not happen without congressional action of some kind. But let's explore this idea that you've proposed here. You're basically arguing that, like tobacco, that a warning label, coupled with research and also reporting on the harms that social media can cause, that it can make people make a different choice when it comes to social media. So where have you seen that kind of self-policing work that leads you to believe a warning label would make a real difference for teens? Well, thanks for asking, Amna. And let me just step back and say that the reason I'm calling for this warning label is because I want kids and parents to know what we know in public health and science now, which is that social media use among adolescents is associated with mental health harms. Many people don't know that out there, and it's important that we share that. In terms of why this could potentially be effective, the good news is we have experience with warning labels from tobacco and alcohol. And in studying that experience, what we can see, particularly from tobacco labels, is that they are effective in increasing awareness and in changing behavior. And so what we would do in the case of a label like this is once Congress authorized such a label, uh, that would then start off a phase, a scientific phase of testing, uh, different designs, different locations for the label uh, to ensure that it was maximally effective in increasing awareness. And to be clear, this is a digital warning. Uh, that would appear when people use social media on a regular basis. 
So there are some who say, look, saying that social media is the thing responsible for the teen mental health crisis that we know we're in is a lot like the folks used to say, well, rock music is responsible for bad teen behavior or video games are responsible for teen violence, the so-called moral panic argument. What do you say to that? Well, I, can, I, can, I certainly understand that argument, but I think those are fundamentally different issues. What we have not seen, whether it was in the case of rock music or television or radio or the telephone, was something that so wholly and completely pervaded the lives of our kids with an array of content that is just unparalleled. And so many of our children are using social media you know, nearly constantly. And in fact, if you look at the averages, Amna, you see that 4.8 hours per day is the average amount of social media use among adolescents. But we also see uh, that what kids are being exposed to now is really quite disturbing. Violent and sexual content, people are being harassed and bullied often by strangers uh, online. Uh, six in 10 young girls are saying, uh, young adolescent girls are saying that they have been approached by strangers on social media in ways that made them feel uncomfortable. This is fundamentally different from the other factors that we've talked about. And most importantly, let's look at the data itself, which is telling us about this association between social media use and mental health harms. Nearly half of adolescents are saying themselves that using social media is making them feel worse about their body image. So this is not an imagined problem. This is not a moral panic. This is a scientific concern that requires a public health solution. A warning label is part of that. You also wrote about the benefits of social media a little bit last year. You talked about how LGBTQ youth in particular or other kids from marginalized communities can find community and connections and fight isolation online, that social media can do that. They can find mental health support in many ways, too. Are you now saying that the potential bad outweighs the potential good? Well, in fact, what I was saying last year is that there is a mix of benefits and harms, but that for many of our kids, the harms outweigh the benefits. Just take LGBTQ youth, for example. Uh, while, yes, we have seen, thankfully, that many LGBTQ youth have been able to find a sense of community online, in some cases that they may not have been able to find in person, we also know that they are much more likely to be harassed online, on social media, uh, than straight kids. And so we've got to take all of this into account. And again, when you look at the population-wide data, you see that the harms are quite significant. When it comes to medications, for example, another example of a product where there's a mix of harms and benefits, uh, we don't say that uh, any benefit uh, justifies extraordinary harms. If there are the harms outweigh the benefits, we pull the medicine from the market, we put restrictions on it in terms of who can use it, how it should be used. You talk about this in your op-ed from the parents' perspective in particular. You write, quote, there's no seatbelt for parents to click, no helmet to snap in place, no assurance that trusted experts have investigated and ensured that these are platforms safe for our kids. You basically say it's parents and kids against some of the best equipped and, and best resource companies in the world. And I should point out, you are also a parent. Your children are on the younger end, but parents who are struggling with this will wonder, how are you handling this in your own home? Look, this is a really hard time for parents across the country. Uh, many of us are trying to figure out how to manage these technologies that we didn't grow up with that are having profound impacts on the health and well-being of our kids. And right until now, what, what really pains me is that the entire burden of managing this has been placed on the shoulders of parents and their kids. And that's simply not right. Uh, what I'm planning to do with my children uh, is, is to, number one, wait until at least after middle school uh, to have them use social media. And then I'll reevaluate when they're in high school based on their maturity, the data about safety, and whether or not there are safety standards in place. For parents who are, kids are already on social media, what I recommend to them is to create tech-free zones in their children's life to protect sleep, in-person interaction, and physical activity, which are vital for their development. That could look like making sure that meal times, when you're all together, are tech-free experiences, or making sure that you take away devices an hour before bedtime, and then you give them back in the morning, so you protect the quality and quantity of sleep. But regardless of all of these measures, Amna, what we have to do as parents is to have each other's back on this. We've got to work together, start talking more openly about this so we don't feel the shame that so many parents feel at not being able to manage this on their own. That's the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, joining us tonight. Dr. Murthy, always great to see you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amna. Good to be with you, too.
Last year, Americans spent over $50 billion on weight loss drugs like Ozempic and Wegovy. Their popularity and their price are having effects throughout the economy. PBS NewsHour special correspondent and Washington Post columnist Catherine Rampell has the story. I would have come right here. At the grocery store, Biscoff. Taryn Mitchell always made oh, a beeline to the cookies. Biscoff would have gotten me every time. Mitchell and, has long uh, struggled with her weight. Say, this says that a serving size is four cookies. I would not have been able to stop at four cookies. I'm like, I would have had four cookies, and then the next hour I would be hearing them call me. The noise would be so loud that I would have to eat all the cookies because they just can't be there. They, they miss me when they're in the pantry. <laughs> they need me. Her food noise was muted thanks to a new class of drugs called GLP-1s, such as Ozempic, Wegovy, and Zepbound. They were first made to treat diabetes. After being approved for weight loss, prescriptions have surged. About one in eight U.S. adults has now taken these meds. The name brand versions cost about $1,000 without insurance. It changes the way my brain responds to the hunger, and it changes the way my brain tells me that I am hungry, right? So your stomach still rumbles a little bit, but it is not a voracious uh, monster in there that's, feed me, Seymour. It is not that. She would tried everything. I have tried fasting. I have tried so many different um, weight loss medications. Two rounds of surgery, you name it, I have tried it. Mitchell started Wegovy last summer. It's transformed not only her shape, but her spending. How much money do you think you're saving on groceries? I would probably say I'm saving about $100 a month. That's not uncommon. It's about 20% decline in monthly spend on groceries for a one-person household. We see the biggest decline. When Leo Feller is chief economist at research firm Numerator. He's been following how GLP-1 meds are changing spending habits. Categories where we see the greatest increases in consumption. He tracks receipts for about 18,000 households who volunteer that at least one member has taken these drugs. A little bit over half are using them for diabetes. And that means a little bit under half are using them for weight loss. For those taking the drugs to lose weight, you see bigger declines in things like chips, in things like candy, in things like ice cream, uh, sugary sodas. We're a row. As online pharmacies make versions of these drugs more widely available, snack food makers have begun worrying about their bottom lines. Walmart's U.S. CEO said that shoppers on GLP-1s are buying less food. Do you see any impact of the Hershey's GLP-1 Michelle Buck told CNBC her firm is watching the situation. We are closely monitoring it, uh, but we believe we can adapt. In fact, Nestle just announced a new line of foods intended for GLP-1 users. There's also evidence that these meds may decrease other addictive behaviors like drinking, smoking, and drug use. On spirits consumption outside of the holidays, we saw an effect, and we saw a little bit of an effect on wine and beer. Mitchell buys less wine and Jack Daniels. When was the last time you saw the gentleman Jack? Christmas. Oh, wow. Whereas in the before times? Oh, he and I were very well acquainted. Okay. Okay. Mitchell's obesity is now in remission. You started this journey not out of vanity, not because you were unhappy with how you looked. You did it for health reasons, correct? Absolutely. I don't want to be sick. And both my parents had dementia and Alzheimer's. I think there are seven women in my family that have been stricken with breast cancer. These are things that have a causal link to obesity. We don't know, of course, you know, what is actually causing them, but the link is there. There are over 200 diseases that have been connected to obesity. Jessica Bartfield, an obesity medicine specialist, is Mitchell's doctor. Things like type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, strokes, osteoarthritis, neoplasms or cancers. Mitchell says her overall health has improved. She no longer has diabetes, for example. I'm on Wegovy for the rest of my life, but I can show you an entire medicine cabinet full of medications that I no longer have to take. 
Feller was so struck by his data that he himself recently began using a GLP-1 and has lost 25 pounds of COVID weight. There is a long-term health benefit, right? My 70-year-old self is going to be thanking me. If people are healthier, they might live longer lives. They might have less morbidity later on in their lives. The drugs are pricey. Some patients may have to take them for the rest of their lives. And we don't yet know all of the long-term effects. Tight squeeze. Right now, they don't pay for themselves in reduced healthcare spending, but someday they might, if insurers and payers get a discount. We've measured the additional costs that come from having these prescription drugs against the savings you get from reduced cardiovascular outcomes and things like that. Right now, it looks like at something like a 50% discount on the cost of the drugs, you would actually be saving the healthcare system money as a result of these treatments. Health economist Michael Dickstein says the drugs might have effects on the labor force, too. There's an effect on your productivity at work, the years in which you work. That's certainly been true for Mitchell. I have more energy. I picked up a little summer job at the baseball field. Just, I'm trying new things and I am enjoying it. Could you have taken the summer job before you had lost all this weight? No, I would just be too tired, to be quite honest. All this affects government spending, too, on things like Social Security and Medicare. But it can cut both ways. You might have additional years working. Um, that's something to compute. You also have additional years of life after you retire, which means the pensions are going to have to pay out for a longer period. The drugs alone could lead Medicare spending to skyrocket, especially as they get approved for more health issues. Eli Lilly's drug is under investigation for sleep apnea. Wagovi itself is under investigation for Alzheimer's disease. So at the point at which that gets approved, assuming it does, that's going to be another fraction of the population within Medicare that would be eligible. So we're talking billions of dollars more in spending per year just on Medicare. That's right. Given the high upfront costs, U.S. states and private insurers are struggling with whether to cover them. Individuals switch employers quite often. In the U.S., that means sometimes you switch your insurance provider. It doesn't always make sense for them to pay for this treatment today because the cost savings might go to a different insurer or to the Medicare program. Do an injection once a week. Bart Field sees it here in North Carolina. The state employee health plan recently stopped covering GLP-1 drugs for weight loss due to cost. This can be a barrier, um, and it can be frustrating, particularly when you think that that is the best treatment for a patient. Another barrier, overflowing demand for the drugs, has meant that patients like Mitchell have faced shortages. I didn't start the medication when it was first prescribed because I couldn't find it at any pharmacy. We did horseback riding on the beach. Even if and Mitchell's so, cutting back on groceries, she has found herself spending money on other activities, like horseback riding with her daughters. It was amazing, to be quite honest. I would have never thought to go horseback riding on the beach. Because? You're over 200 pounds, you know, you don't want to hurt the horse. I know that doesn't sound logical, but these are the things that you think. I would take the girls horseback riding and I would watch them. Because I always want my children to have these experiences but I never thought that I would be part of the experience. And this is the coolest. Something you can't put a price on. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Katherine Rampell in Greensboro, North Carolina. More than 60 years after a birth control pill was developed for women, there is still no similar federally approved drug for men. But promising results using a new gel for men might finally change that. William Brangham has the details. Um, now, while this drug is still being tested, it has already generated a lot of interest. It's a clear gel that you rub on your shoulder once a day, and early results show that it blocks sperm production after two to three months of daily use. Dr. Brian Wynn is an associate professor of clinical obstetrics and gynecology at the USC Keck School of Medicine, and he was involved in this current study. Dr. Wynn, thank you so much for being here. So how does this gel work? What, what's the mechanism of action here? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to hear that there's more and more interest in male contraception. Uh, in terms of the way that this works, it is a hormonal method, and so uh, to understand the hormonal system here requires you to understand that it works kind of like a thermostat that's always measuring um, how hot or cold uh, your room or your house is. Uh, and in this case, uh, your thermostat is measuring how much testosterone 
uh, is in your body. And so if you give testosterone, uh, thermos will sense there's too much in the same way that if it's too hot, it'll sense that it's too much and therefore it'll turn off the heater. So in this case, in this case you are turning off the testes. You're turning off um, the production of testosterone in the body, which will also turn off the production of sperm. What's nice about that is that we know that this factory is intact. All you're doing is you're flipping some switches so that when you flip the switch back on, then you're going to have reversal of the uh, sperm production and you'll have full production once again. So the, the, the hormones that are applied bring sperm production down to a low enough level so that a man couldn't impregnate his partner. That's correct. Um, you know, the, the majority of men actually get down to zero sperm, uh, but we actually know that you don't need zero sperm to prevent pregnancy. Actually, uh, our threshold is about one million per milliliter. You can still have a million sperm per milliliter and not get someone pregnant? It sounds a little bit crazy to say, but, uh, you know, we our, our threshold for actually a low sperm count is about 20 million. So um, when you consider that fact, right, uh, dropping down by an order of magnitude uh, really does reduce your risk of pregnancy. Okay, so the uh, I know you haven't published your full results yet, but how promising does this look for being a legit male contraceptive? Well, I think it's extremely promising, uh, and I'm so glad you brought that up because we actually do have trials in the past that have shown us that hormonal methods uh, are capable of preventing pregnancy, and so we feel very confident about that. And so as long as we can drop the sperm counts down to where we want them, um, then we've got a method that uh, should be able to prevent pregnancy. And I know you spoke with some of the participants in this trial. Have, did they describe any side effects that you've been you've been documenting? Well, certainly, it's a hormonal method, and so uh, we definitely do talk about uh, potential side effects that can be involved: mood changes, weight changes, changes in libido that can be up or down, acne as well. Our, our participants do mention that uh, they do experience these ch these changes. However, the question is how bothersome um, are these side effects to them, and for these men or these couples to stay in the trial for you know more than a year uh, using exclusively this method on a daily basis really is proof of the pudding that you know we, we got something here. Um, Dr. Wynn, why has it taken so long to get to this point? I mean, I understand that, that studies were done initially on this back in the 1970s, but for all of those decades, this burden has largely fell fallen on women. Why has it taken so long for a male contraceptive? You know, so many reasons from a, from a physical industry standpoint, also from social biases. But, uh, you know, my take of it is that uh, there's also been this thought that men don't want to be involved or uh, don't have enough knowledge about reproductive systems and their responsibility to really engage in this uh, responsibility. I think things are changing. I would say that uh, in this in this last year, we've see, received such a huge uptick in media interest in male contraception that it seems like there's kind of a shift in uh, what I would consider uh, expectations for gender equity. Let's say all of this goes smoothly and the tests work out as you hope they do. When might we see a product on the market? You know, it's commonly said that anywhere between five to 10 years is about an appropriate timeline. I would say that, uh, you know, thanks to folks like yourself who are giving us a little bit more uh, time in the spotlight, it might increase the demand. And I think that increased demand and that public awareness is what is going to drive um, the speed of how things go for us. All right, Dr. Brian Wynn at the USC Keck School of Medicine, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you so much. Take care. From an A-list fundraiser in Hollywood to a round table at a black church in Michigan, the two leading presidential candidates were in search of campaign cash and votes this weekend. It's a perfect time for Politics Monday. That's Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter and Sophia Kai of Axios. Tamara Keith is away. Great to see you both. Hello. So President Biden was in California uh, at this fundraiser, notched the single biggest Democratic fundraising hall with a $30 million event there with some Hollywood celebrities. Meanwhile, former President Trump 
was in Michigan trying to appeal to black voters, and we've seen in recent polling that he's made some inroads. USA Today numbers from earlier in June show in both Michigan and in Pennsylvania. Mr. Biden's seen some slip uh, of that support there. It's down to now 54 percent of black voters in Michigan and 56 percent in Pennsylvania. For Mr. Trump, that's up to 15 percent and 11 percent. Amy, it's worth pointing out the numbers for President Biden in 2020 were over 90 yeah, percent. Right. Among black <clears throat> voters, how do you look at those now? Yeah, What's going and on? that and that for Trump, even though as you say, 11 percent, 15 percent doesn't seem very significant. That's double the support that he got in a state like Pennsylvania, where he got seven percent right. uh, of the black vote. Um, this is something clearly the Biden campaign is seeing too. This isn't just in public polls. There's a reason that the vice president has been spending as much time as she has been at historically black black colleges. The president himself has been out speaking to uh, black voters in key swing states now for months. Mm -hmm. That this slippage is as much about enthusiasm uh, as anything else. As you're seeing, while Trump has picked up some support, there are a lot of people that who are sitting on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. right? Um, who are saying, maybe I'm going to vote for a third-party candidate, um, or maybe I'm going to stay home. And when you talk to Democratic strategists, what they'll tell you is the real gap, those voters who are really deciding whether they're going to vote or not, third-party, maybe Trump, um, overwhelmingly are younger voters. That's the biggest, the generation gap, this one uh, Democratic strategist said, is the real significant driver right now mm -hmm. of black vote uh, different between, say, 2020 or 2016 and this upcoming election. And getting those younger voters engaged is really challenging, not just because these voters may not be impressed with Biden, they don't like Trump necessarily either, but they're also feeling that the institution itself, mm -hmm. the political institutions, have really failed them or they don't see any reason to be involved there. So that big, big, big worry if you're the Democrats when yeah. you have to count on those voters showing up to, well, to win those key swing states. To that point, Sophia, as Amy points out, it's not like they're going to Mr. Trump, right? So he's likely not going to win that vote with these kinds of numbers, 15 percent, 11 percent in Michigan and Pennsylvania. But for him, what is the strategy here in courting that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. So I think it's twofold. On the one hand, you know, the Trump campaign knows that they're not going to win 20, 30 percent, you know, as they're saying publicly. I mean, it's just nonsense. But even if they're able to get one to two percent more than the nine percent that they got last time, specifically in those swing state cities like Detroit and Atlanta, then, you know, that is within a margin that that could move enough voters, it could change the result of the election in that. Uh, in those states. And so that's um, their objective, is to get that marginal votes and also to make the Biden campaign sweat, to force them to spend more resources shoring up Biden's coalition of minority voters. And spend more money in places that are more expensive to campaign in as well, mm -hmm. right? Well, speaking of campaigns, there's some key primaries in Virginia tomorrow in particular that I want to ask you both about. There's the retirement of two key Democrats, um, Abigail Spanberger and Jennifer Wexton, which is going to mean two open seats. But there's a lot of focus on this one race of the Republican House Freedom Caucus Chair Bob Good, who's facing a very tough challenge and a Trump-backed uh, uh, candidate there is the state representative John McGuire. Mm -hmm. like, tell us a little bit more about the GOP and yeah. their endorsement strategy. Amy, why, yeah. why is this a race you're watching? This is a, really not a race about ideology mm -hmm. or policy. It's about revenge. And the revenge <laughs> is on the part of Donald Trump, as well as Kevin McCarthy, who was the former speaker, of course. Uh, Bob Good, the incumbent congressman, has crossed them both, and they both want to exact a price for that. Uh, Donald Trump uh, the way he, the way Bob Good crossed Donald Trump is that he endorsed Ron DeSantis in the presidential race. Now, when Ron DeSantis dropped out, he went and endorsed Donald Trump. Doesn't matter. <laughs> you have you have crossed Donald Trump, and for that, you will pay a price. Now, look, there are members of uh, the right who are coming to Bob Good's defense, so it is not that clean of a separation. That sort of you know Bob Good out on an island by himself, but it tells you a lot about fealty to Donald Trump mm -hmm. and what Donald Trump's uh, uh, decision to go in after this one House member 
it's not going to make any difference in terms of the makeup of Congress. The person who would replace him is equally conservative. It's just sending a message to other Republicans that there is a price to pay for being disloyal. Sophia, I know you've been looking closely at who Mr. Trump chooses to endorse and when. What should we understand about the strategy here? So this cycle, more so than 22, the Trump campaign and Trump himself has been a lot more cautious yeah. in terms of who they endorse and when they endorse. We know that Trump has been waiting a lot longer to endorse in competitive Republican primaries. For instance, in Montana, he waited to endorse Tim Sheehy over a more conservative, more MAGA candidate, mm -hmm. Matt Rosendale. In Nevada, he waited to endorse Sam Brown over Jeff Gunter, who is his own ambassador to Iceland. These are some examples of Trump picking better candidates who have military backgrounds um, and a better chance of winning. And you know, for, for Trump, he likes to win. I think that's ultimately what it comes down to. And even down ballot, we see him endorsing the day before some of these primaries, just the day before. That doesn't really give these candidates a lot of room to really flaunt that endorsement. I don't know if you could do it in less than a minute, Amy, but how does, all, how does Governor Hogan fit into all of this? Who, you know, Trump's campaign manager said his campaign's over when former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan said, respect the ruling in New York right. in, in Trump's criminal trial. But now Mr. Trump has come forward and endorsed him on his Senate run. Right. How does that make sense? Yeah, because, again, he wants to be a team player. Okay. I, I think that a lot of folks saw the uh, backhanded, uh, well, the situation there and thought, well, uh, he wants to be a team player. If, if Larry Hogan wants to be the kind of uh, Republican, maybe not a full Trump all in, uh, I'll still support him. I just think that is not going to be a reality. That at the end of the day, the party is in Trump's image, and that's the way that Donald Trump would like it to remain. And control of the Senate is that's at right. stake. That's right. Amy Walter, Sophia Kai, great to see you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. In 2021, an affluent suburban school district in Texas gained national attention when parents and local conservative activists accused the district of indoctrinating students with critical race theory. That drew the interest of Republican figures across the country and sparked a Christian movement beyond the district's borders to restrict what children are being taught in schools. Laura Barone Lopez has that story for our bookshelf. Mike Hixenbaugh has been at the forefront of covering the events in South Lake, Texas. What started as an earnest effort by the Carroll Independent School District to confront racist rhetoric and bullying devolved into a battle about much more. Conservative parents and activists turned a district cultural competence plan into a fight over protecting their, quote, traditional way of life. The result? Books and classroom discussion about race, slavery, and sexual orientation were effectively banned. In his book, They Came for the Schools, released in May, Hixenbaugh details how this school district became a blueprint for Republicans across the country and exposed their ambitions, which go well beyond controlling what version of American history makes it into high school textbooks. I'm joined now by the author and senior investigative reporter for NBC News, Mike Hixenbaugh. Mike, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. When you started investigating, you discovered that there were a number of racist incidents at the schools in South Lake, some that go back decades, but in particular, in 2018, when a video of white students saying the N-word went viral, and the district promised action, what exactly was their plan in response to that? After the video came out, dozens of parents came forward and said, it's not just a video. My, my black child has experienced the, these kind of racist slurs and jokes in the school for decades. Uh, and so the district put together a committee and they formed, uh, they put together a plan called the Cultural Competence Action Plan. They worked for two years on this, from 2018 to 2020. And the plan essentially called for uh, diversity training for students and teachers, um, initiatives to, tr to try to hire more diverse teaching staff, uh, a plan to go through the curriculum to make sure that kids were learning an honest and full picture of America's history. But the plan was released in 2020 in the midst of backlash against the Black Lives Matter movement. And so when it was released into the community, some conservatives who I guess hadn't been paying attention to the two years of, of work on the plan, 
they saw it as this plan that was being shepherded in by the radical left to try to ruin this affluent, successful school district. In response, a local conservative group, the South Lake Families PAC, said that they rallied what they called an army to their cause. How did they convince the community, essentially, to turn on school district leaders, school board leaders, teachers that many of these people had known for years? It was remarkable to watch because the people who were advancing this cultural competence action plan, many, many of them were themselves conservative Republicans. But the South Lake Families PAC painted anyone who was pushing this plan as a radical leftist, as a Marxist. And it was around the same time that critical race theory was entering the national conversation, this, this phrase that Chris Rufo used to try to describe any attempt to address uh, discrimination in schools and, and in other places. It became a battle between adults over who was welcome in South Lake, whose ideas were welcome there. And that fight ended up spreading all over the country. Chris Rufo, the national conservative activist, what role did he play in taking South Lake and spreading it elsewhere and making it a national cause. After South Lake Families PAC got organized, they put together a slate of conservative school board candidates whose mission was to destroy, defeat that diversity plan. South Lake, the South Lake Families PAC candidates won in a landslide election in May of 2021. And Chris Rufo, after that, was one of many conservative voices who then held up the election in South Lake as a model to be copied in schools all over the country. You say that the end goals were bigger than even just teachings about history, stretching all the way to making schools more explicitly Christian. What is the end goal here, and where are we seeing it in other places? There are elements of the Christian right in America that have long argued that the separation of church and state is a myth, that our country began to decline in the 1960s when prayer and mandatory Bible readings were removed from schools. And they have seized on this moment to say, parents are upset about schools. This is our chance to try to chip away at those foundational principles. And so you're seeing in Texas and all over the country moves to in this moment, not just remove LGBTQ content from schools or to ban how, restrict how teachers talk about race and racism, but to replace those things with Christian symbols. There's bills to mandate the Ten Commandments be hung in every classroom, to put Christian chaplains in schools to replace counselors and therapists, um, and to, to bring the Bible back into school and, and have kids read from that as part of their social studies curriculum. They are counting on lawsuits. Some activists have said explicitly that told school districts or school board members hey, you, if you bring prayer back to school, hopefully someone will sue you. We can take that to the Supreme Court and we can win this for America. More than three years into this, what does the resistance movement look like outside of South Lake and the other communities that are facing book bans and, uh, and having difficulty when it comes to being able to teach history? But we've seen now all over the country in kind of purple or left-leaning suburbs Coalitions of progressive and moderate conservative parents banding together, forming their own political action committees, running their own slate of candidates. And so we're seeing that in different places across the country where Moms for Liberty isn't winning in a lot of places. Their ideas are not necessarily broadly popular even among a lot of conservatives. And so um, we've, we've seen kind of a, a, a wave of victories for the other side. Based on all of your reporting in South Lake and the larger movement to revise American history, what do you think is at stake this election cycle? Oh, I think about stories like uh, a teacher I highlight in the book named Christina McGurk, a fourth grade teacher who got into education because she wanted to live out her own Christian faith by showing kindness to kids and, and teaching them a real accounting of America and how to be kind to each other. But as a result of her speaking out about these issues, she was forced out of her her job. And we're seeing that repeated all over the country. Teachers are weighing whether or not they're going to stay in the classroom. And at the same time, families, parents are looking at what's happening and wondering, do I want to keep sending my kid to this school? Do I want to still live in this community? And as a result, people's lives are literally being upended. Mike Hixenbaugh of NBC News, thank you. Thank you.
And that is the News Hour for tonight. I'm Amna Navaz. On behalf of the entire News Hour team, thank you for joining us. Major funding for the PBS News Hour has been provided by Cunard is a proud supporter of public television. On a voyage with Cunard, the world awaits. A world of flavor, diverse destinations, and immersive experiences. A world of leisure and British style. All with Cunard's White Star service. Supported by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. And with the ongoing support of these institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.